All right, good morning, everyone. Well, good morning for us, at least in California. Um, and welcome to VSPG. Today we have a presentation by Judy Pu at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and placement of the Franklin Large Igneous Province and initiation of the Sturgeon Snowball Earth. Next week, we have a presentation by Nick Tosca. He just sent me an email this morning about it. Um, but uh, it's going to take me a second to find it. I'll post up his abstract quite pretty soon, though. So um, check the website uh, shortly to uh, see what Nick is going to talk about next week. And I mentioned this last week, but uh, we're fine. We've been informed that people are starting to use some of these videos for their classes or for their uh, seminars um, at their respective universities. And if you are, um, please do just let us know because knowing those statistics would be really useful for us. Um, that's exactly something we'd like to come out of this. Um, if you aren't and you think you'd like to, feel free. It's definitely something we invite everybody to do. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Judy for us. Judy Pu is a sedimentologist working towards constraining the onset and conditions of cryogenian snowball earth events using samarium, neodymium, isotopes, zircon, and badeliite, bat, yeah, badleyite geochronology, and field mapping and sedimentology for her work. In addition to work on cryogenian glaciation that we'll be hearing about today, she also has worked on the ediacaran gaskiers glacial and its relation to the evolution of the Eacra biota. She completed her bachelor's in the Earth and Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Science Department at MIT before, before starting her PhD with Dr. Francis McDonald with a, an NSF GRFP fellowship. And we're happy to have you presenting today, Judy. So um, please go ahead and unmute yourself and take it away. Thanks, Alex. Um... So yeah, I'm a graduate student at UCSB. Today I'm presenting some new geochronology for the emplacement of the Franklin Lip um, and how it could be related to the Sturgeon Snowball Earth. Uh, so this work was done in collaboration with um, everyone listed here. Um, and I'm really excited to present our new results. Um, and I, I wanted to say, this is a photo of Franklin Sills on Victoria Island. All field photos are from Rob Rambert, so thanks Rob. Um, they're all really beautiful, so I tried to use as many as I could. So just going over um, the hypothesis of snowball Earth, uh, at least twice during the cryogenian, ice covered Earth's surface from its poles to its equatorial latitudes. Um, so this is work um, that was revived in the 1990s with some low latitude ice glacials determined by Kirschwink. Um, and Paul Hoffman really led the survival in the 90s, um, but the ideas have started since the, since the 60s. And the idea is that as ice coverage increases, um, at some point you'll reach an unstable climate state where enough of that incoming solar radiation is reflected back that Earth will just continue to cool and drop into a snowball state. So these are all based on radiative balance models of solar radiation. Uh, and these balance models predict that you should have a synchronous start and synchronous end, that these snowball events should last for multi-millions of years um, because you need to build up enough CO2 to escape a snowball state. And this is a global phenomenon. Uh, we should see evidence of it all over Earth at that time. And that is what we see. So this is a compilation from Hoffman et al. 2017, that review paper. Um, Snowball Earth glacial deposits are globally ubiquitous. Um, and geochronology, at least for the Sturgeon glaciation, is very clear, shows a 57 million year duration. Uh, so long enough to build up CO2 in the atmosphere. And it's consistent with synchronous start and end. Um, but we still do have a couple of unanswered questions about these events, including why they happened. And a lot of people have proposed uh, a lot of ideas, so I'm just going to go over what's on the table, <laughs> um, starting with the weathering of continental flood basalt. So 
But Rhea et al. is that fire and ice paper, um, drawing some inspiration from Robert Frost. Uh, so Gaudry proposed that it was the emplacement of a large igneous province that could have uh, drawn down CO2 through silicate weathering and caused the onset of glaciation. This idea was followed up by McDonald et al. 2010 with a preliminary age on the Franklin lip um, and Cox et al. 2016 um, based on strontium neodymium isotopes showing a, a flood of juvenile material during the uh, Neoproterozoic. Um, other ideas include the um, sulfur aerosol emissions hypothesis, so that um, we can think of Mount Pinatubo, for example, that the, the volcanic activity would have put, up, put enough sulfur aerosols into the atmosphere to reflect incoming solar radiation and cool the Earth as well. This would be a very um, fast mechanism. It's uh, sulfur aerosols rain out of the atmosphere very rapidly. Um, there's also even been some ideas that an asteroid could have caused snowball at Spencer and Barham. Um, others have noted that maybe the orientation and position of the continents was just paleogeographically favorable for entering a glacial state. So that's proposed by these authors, um, for example. So the continents were clustered um, around the equator at this time, away from the poles. And so you can imagine as ice coverage increases covering the dark oceans at the poles, you're introducing a greater difference in albedo already than if continents were at the poles. In addition, if you have continents in the tropics, you're in, um, increasing the tropical runoff, uh, creation of clays, barrel of organic matter, and, um, and drawdown of CO2. So that's what these authors emphasize. Uh, there are some other ideas about how the Neoproterozoic diversification of eukaryotes could have played a role in drawing down CO2 um, or even creating some um, new sulfur aerosol condensation nuclei um, just from organic aerosols. And lastly, there's the idea that um, Earth can enter a snowball state stochastically, which is kind of scary. But the idea is just based on the the observation of this large variance in CO2 concentrations over Earth history. Um, so it is actually pretty high. And as CO2 has decreased over the course of Earth history because of stellar luminosity increasing, um, if variance doesn't also decrease over time, we could just stochastically drop into a snowball state. Um, conveniently, I've highlighted three hypotheses that could all be related to the same phenomenon, um, the emplacement of the Franklin Large Igneous Province. Um, and just to introduce this uh, province, um, we do know that the Franklin Large Igneous Province was emplaced at equatorial latitudes. Um, so there's been a lot of paleomagnetism work done. This is a really robust poll. Um, I've just cited Venetian et al., a grand mean poll from Venetian here. And this is a little reconstruction from um, just modified from Cox et al. Um, but yeah, the, we, we do know that the Franklin lip was in place at equatorial latitudes. Um, and we also can see from the spread of this dike swarm that its total area could have covered more than 5 million square kilometers. Um, and since Siberia has drifted away, we don't really know the extent of the coverage in Siberia, but of course this area could even be doubled. Um, so that makes it one of the largest slips in Earth history. Um, just going over the, the hypotheses that have been proposed for the Franklin lip causing onset. So as I mentioned before, McDonald et al. 2010 um, and McDonald and Wordsworth 2017 alternately present arguments for the weathering of the Franklin lip or the sulfur aerosols produced by the Franklin lip resulting in onset of the certain glaciation. So these ideas relied on a preliminary badly date of around 716 MA from the sample S8 on Victoria Island. And 716 does overlap with onset constraints between 717 and 716. Um, but this is a very preliminary date, it's one sample. And this kind of highlights the idea that we can use high precision geochronology to test these hypotheses. Um, because the time scales of climate forcings are very different. So on the left, um, I've just included a, a model result from Jones et al. 2005. This is actually, these are two different Joneses, um, just to make that clear. 
Um, but for things from sulfur aerosols, we know last uh, for a very brief amount of time because of um, because they're large enough that they they just rain out of the atmosphere. So um, they last up to a decade um, following input. But basically, that effect, that cooling effect, has to be nearly coincident with emplacement. Then, um, in contrast, um, cooling from the weathering of lip is greatest um, maybe one to two million years following the initial input of CO2, uh, because lips are gigantic. Uh, volcanic provinces, they will input a lot of atmospheric CO2 as well, that then that weathering will have to offset. So looking again at these multiple mechanisms proposed and their different timescales I've just highlighted here. So weathering of the continental flood basalts um, should lead to onset in the, on the scale of one to two million years after emplacement. If snowball earth was induced by sulfur aerosol emissions, that has to be, the emplacement has to be pretty much coincident with onset constraints. Um, and if we're just talking about paleo geography, that's, that could happen on the order of multi-million years, right? If you're thinking about the drift of continents. Um, so looking at existing geochronology for a Franklin lip, um, they actually span 750 to 710 MA. I've only plotted it 730 to 710 for comparison here. Almost all previous geochronology was done using either bulk Batleyite analyses or single grain Batleyite analyses. This one striped analysis from Human et al. also included bulk zircon analyses. Um, so it's quite a range um, for the Franklin lip. And so the question here is, is this spread in ages actually a, a, a true representation of the age of this Franklin lip event? Um, and here I've also just highlighted what these hypotheses would look like. Um, as I've said, if it's due to sulfur aerosols, um, your Franklin lip age should be coincident with onset constraints, right? Um, if instead the, the weathering the Franklin lip caused onset of glaciation, um, your age should be preceding onset by one to two million years. Um, and then if the Franklin lip is unrelated to the Syrian glaciation, you might expect the age of the emplacement to be somewhere in these red regions. And just to briefly go over existing large Angus province geochronology, so there have been vast improvements in analytical precision over the last decade. Um, so now we can get dates on these events on order of 0.1% um, precision of that original age. Um, chemical abrasion, this technique developed by Mattinson in 2005, has really helped mitigate the effects of lead loss in zircon, which is especially important for these pre-Cambrian studies with these older zircon that do have radiation damage. Um, and from a recent review of these LIP studies by Caswell et al. 2021, nearly all of these high precision studies show that LIPs are emplaced in less than 1 million years. And here's an example of the camp um, so you can see spanning um, to 1.7 to 200.8 MA, the intrusives and extrusives are all in place in less than a million years. So this is pretty impressive. Um, like it's awesome work showing that these gigantic provinces are in place. Uh, the majority of these gigantic provinces are in place in less than 1 million years. So with that in mind, the spread in dates that we see from previous geochronology is inconsistent with other high precision studies of LIPS. Um, this likely obscures the actual relationship between emplacement and glaciation. Um, and we'd like to improve on that. So that was the point of the study. Uh, so going over our sample locations, so we really try to cover the geographic range of the Franklin. Um, we have some samples from Baffin Island, um, a sample from Great Slate Lake. Um, and uh, our samples also ranged in composition from Gebroic to Granitic. Uh, what a typical sample um, just uh, is, is basically just, we just had sand samples to work with. Um, most of our samples were from GSC archive. Um, but Rob and Francis also managed to collect some samples. 
Um, so we're working with these hand samples mostly. Um, here's an example of FA700408. It's this gabbro with CPX alteration hormone. So there's some hydrous alteration going on here. And then on the other end of the composition scale, we have uh, 93 JP, 71 JB with this granophoric texture. So all of our samples that had um, um, these uh, had uh, quartz and orthoblase had granophoric texture basically. And just to show some examples of what our grains look like, um, these are two samples, 14 RAT 513A and 17 RAT R35B1 collected by Rob. Um, so you can see there's quite a range in um, the amount of radiation damage the grains have experienced, even though they're basically the same age. Um, so the top one shows that the, um, the grains are, are metamict. They, they almost look opaque when we're, when we're picking them. Um, and in contrast, 17 RT has these really nice, long prismatic grains. Um, for both, you can almost make out, <laughs> and these grains are a little less opaque, that there are these central melt channels going through the middle. So that largely rules out the inclusion of cores of, of inherited grains at their middles. Um, and then and these CL images on the right, um, I just wanted to show that you can see how uh, in 14 RT, we're working with metamic grains. You have these also these broad convolute um, zones from this diorite. Uh, in contrast, 17 RT has this really nice homogeneous zircon. Um, and then uh, the Franklin lip has also been geochemically classified. So this is, um, lips have been geochemically classified since the 60s. So this has um, been a, a, a lot of work over the past couple of decades to classify lips and they can be generally separated into two phases. So there's an earlier phase with more crustal contamination and a later phase with less crustal contamination. And conveniently, the Franklin lip also shows these two, these two groupings. So that gives our ages and samples some context. Um, so this was done by Del Oro in a thesis, Bedard et al. and Beard et al. 2018. So type one is that older phase. It's the low titanium phase. It's stratigraphically below or cross cut by type two um, uh, igneous rocks. And yeah, that's that earlier low volume phase with more crustal contamination. And then type two is the high titanium phase. It's younger, it's the main high volume phase. It's usually uh, more differentiated and shows a waning continental influence in its trace element and isotope ratios. And now I'm going to uh, go over our geochemistry results. I'm just going to walk through this. I know it's a lot, um, but just to highlight these three samples, 17 RT is this light blue, um, FA700408 is this black line, and then SA is this uh, maroon line. You can see that they're all much steeper than the rest of the samples, and they start elevated here. So they're enriched in light rare earth elements. Um, and, and they have steep slopes. So this is more consistent with that type one with crustal contamination. Um, the rest of these samples have these more humped looks to them. They're, they're more middle rare earth enriched. Um, these samples are also more differentiated. So the rest of these samples are more uh, consistent with type two. And looking at that a little bit more in depth, we have isotope data collected by Beard et al. 2018. And here I've plotted our samples with their data. So most of our samples do plot with the other type two compositions. Um, so the younger high volume phase again, whereas 17 RIT and S8, the, those samples for those steep uh, earth element curves um, are more consistent with crustal contamination and uh, type one compositions. Um, the idea is also that um, some incorporation of that basement um, would also shift your values this way. I'm just going to, yeah, so just to help you guide your eye here, um, these are actually some results from the Shaler supergroup sediments. So that's why we, uh, we've just modeled here what some sediment incorporation would look like along these curves. Um, but basically, more sediment and basement contamination would push your, or your geochemistry um, up and to the left on this plot. And that's, that's more consistent with type one compositions. Uh, we do have this 
this flyer out here, FA70048 from Baffin Island, but we know that Baffin Island also has different basements, so that could be affecting how it's moving on this plot. And also, Beard et al. did note that there was this um, Southern Type 1, uh, he called it Southern Type 1, but there's basically a set of Type 1 um, rocks on Victoria Island that he still classified as Type 1 because it's stratigraphically below the other Type 2 samples. Uh, but he hypothesized that there could be different mantle sources that um, these uh, rocks are tapping into. So that, that could be yet another explanation for this flyer on Baffin Island. But in general, most of our samples are consistent with type 2 geochemistry. So they have positive epsilon neodymium um, and uh, shallower uh, rare earth element curves and less crustal contamination. Um, so with that context, again, type 2 is that younger main high volume phase. So most of our ages here are on that, uh, on that phase. Um, and just to walk through the, the geochronology here, so 93 JP, 71 JP, pretty straightforward. All analyses um, overlapped with each other. We just, the only ones we excluded were the ones that had, that were less precise. Um, they would have just uh, blown up our, our mean, uh, our MSWD actually. Um, so we excluded those, but they basically all reproduce around the same mean. It's very straightforward interpretation here of 719 MA. Uh, the other samples are a little more complicated. And um, I, I do want to note that all samples were chemically abraded for 12 hours at 180 to 190 degrees C. Um, so there, and there's no obvious trends that we noted in our data for the different C chemical abrasion temperatures. But we still did have lead loss, and it's really obvious in 93K, the sample. Um, you can see this trail down to modern. Um, and it's pretty extreme in these younger fragments. So lead loss is really obvious for this sample, which is why we took the, the mean of these oldest grains. And for these other two samples, we did have these younger outliers that were relatively easy to exclude from this mean as well. So that gives us these, these mean weighted mean ages of 718.77, 718.96, 718.61, 718.82, Point two one or point three zero, so they're all roughly uh, around seven nineteen as well. Uh, for these last two samples on the right, they are the most complicated to interpret, um, especially since they are also these older outliers. Um, you can see on Concordia, there are these they're slightly reversely discordant here, um, still within uncertainty on Concordia, uh, and then they have this young tail. Um, a very gradual young tail. Um, so it's it's really hard to tell just from these samples alone what what interpretation we should take from this sample. Um, but in the context of the other samples, um, and because we know that we can't rule out lead loss, we decided to go with this oldest plateau um, at, for their dates. So to summarize, uh, we're working with neoprozoic grains. Um, they're variably radiation damaged and metamigged. Uh, see that from CL imaging and from just uh, picking. Um, and we do know that there is residual lead loss in these samples. We have these older analyses, these older outliers. Um, they that could also be due to a lead implantation. This is a phenomenon that was noted by Mattinson et al. in 1996, um, where damaged uranium rich domains will dissolve readily, while the residual domains that uh, remain after chemical abrasion could have implanted lead that was facilitated by radiation damage, alpha recoil. But also antichrists have been described in mafic systems before, um, even in mid-ocean ridges. Uh, it's just, it's known experimentally. Um, Harrison and Watson showed this in 1993, um, that it's just difficult to melt phases like zircon in dry and fast cooling magmas, and we're, we're dealing with really fast cooling dry magmas. Uh, and we, we call them antichrists rather than xenochrists only because nothing else in this area would, would be this age. So there's nothing to call it a xenochrist from. Um, so with all that in mind, these are our interpreted dates uh, uh, for the Franklin lip. Um, you can see that 
this, the oldest grouping of dates are very consistent for all of our type two samples coming in around 719 MA. And then our interpreted date for 17 RET representing type one composition does have a noticeably older population. Um, and that at least uh, fits stratigraphically as well, because we know that type one has to be older than type two. Um, that we, we did do some badly at geochronology. So that's this one sample from Baffin Island that we got badly out of. Um, and so I'm showing those analyses here. They were uh, less precise and discordant. So we did try to plot an upper intercept um, for this and calculated upper intercept age of around 719 as well, 718.94 plus or minus 1.6 MA. Um, that does overlap with our other Franklin lip samples coming in around 719 again. Um, and then we revisited that age from McDonald et al. 2010 S8. So this sample was analyzed in the same lab previously. Um, here it's just plotted with an updated uh, age because um, that lab updated their, their uranium uh, blank composition. So this is what that age should have been. Um, with a better understanding of their uranium blanks. Um, and that comes out to 715 MA instead of 716. So if you remember that onset constraint uh, of 717, 716, no longer overlaps with the 715 age. Um, if instead we consider that these grains may have undergone some lead loss and we calculated upper intercept age for uh, upper intercept age for this sample we get something around 726 MA. So that also doesn't really overlap with the, the sturdy and glaciation anymore. Um, so no matter what mean you take, it, it's a little inconsistent with our zircon dates, but we do know that there are additional complexities in interpreting bad BI dates. This has been shown by others. Um, so these samples, we could be dealing with lead loss or excess lead um, shifting our brains. Um, so, in summary, this is the new geochronology of the Franklin lip, um, and the updated S8 ages don't overlap with our onset constraints. Um, type 2 emplacement we, we now know is from 719.08 plus or minus 0.22 MA to 718.61 plus or minus 0.3 MA. This gives it a duration roughly of around 470,000 years, um, plus or minus 370,000 years. This is much more consistent with the Casbon et al. 2021 review of lips saying that nearly all well dated lips erupted in less than one million years. <clears throat> um, and now we can see that emplacement of the Franklin lip um, precedes onset. So it, it precedes onset by 0 0.9 to 1.6 uh, million years, depending on uh, basically just if you consider the uncertainties of this youngest analysis and the oldest analysis here. Um, and yeah, we're, we do want to say that we consider the zircon dates to be um, our preferred dates for the Franklin lip, just because of these added complexities in interpreting what these bad BI, um dates might mean. Um, and just to take a closer look at what these onset constraints are to make sure that we are, um, we understand what we're comparing with. Uh, this is a compilation of uh, onset constraints from several localities, um, basically from Ethiopia, Arctic Alaska. So Ethiopia is McLennan et al, 2018. Arctic Alaska is that Cox et al, 2015 age. Um, so the up arrows mean that these are maximum age constraints. They're well below any evidence for glaciation. So glaciation onset has to be uh, younger. Oh, and, and to clarify, it's going younger uh, up this axis. Um, down arrows indicate uh, minimum age constraints, so onset has to be below these because these are actually uh, tufts that are interbedded with glacial diamectites. So glaciation has to have started by then. Um, and um, geochronology of the onset has been complicated by the fact that uh, with a global glaciation, you have a massive base level fall. Um, so with that, most sections are unconformable. So the it's usually diamectite sitting on top of unconformities, but we're just missing this interval of time. So some studies have tried to get around that by dating a horizon that's farther below onset, um, below that unconformity, 
and then extrapolating using a, an assumed sedimentation rate. So that's what these Monte Carlo estimations are. Um, I'm showing one from uh, McLennan et al. and one from Lan et al. 2020. Um, but they're, they're pretty consistent with these dates from the Yukon. Um, so everything lines up. The problem here, though, is that these maximum age constraints um, are from a rhyolite dome. So there, there would be no obvious evidence for glaciation in, in this rhyolite dome. Uh, so it's unclear if glaciation has started just based on these samples. Um, and then other features interpreted as subaerial in the flow above this sample um, could also be subglacial, so that that interpretation of subaerial is a non-unique interpretation. Um, it could have instead have been positive environment like Antarctica's dry valleys. So, so if we consider that um, this rhyolite dome wouldn't have shown evidence of glaciation starting, and we actually have to move onset constraint older, um, that that would place it around here, much closer to our Franklin lip ages. Um, and theoretically, based on modeling, it could have taken a few hundred thousand years after oceans froze over for continental ice sheets to thicken sufficiently to flow and create the glacial features that we could observe. So if we're thinking of dropping this a few hundred thousand years, that would then overlap with our frequent lip ages. Um, but, um, you know, there's there's reason to stick with the existing constraints just because everything else is so consistent with um, these constraints. Um, but I, I did just want to highlight that there is a need for more geochronology studies on on the onset, just to clarify if this is um, of an accurate onset constraint. So, <laughs> revisiting our hypotheses, um, if uh, the Franklin Lip was um, is related to the onset of the Syrian glaciation, it's more consistent with the weathering hypothesis. So here it's it's not coincident with onset, so it's probably not sulfur aerosols. And it'd be hard to say that it's not related at all just because it conveniently falls in this range where weathering would have a maximal effect. Uh, so how would the Franklin Lip have pulled the Earth enough to start global glaciation through weathering? So um, we do know that mafic lithologies are highly reactive. Um, they're uh, really good at uh, dissolving and uh, drawing down CO2. Um, CO2 consumption is highest in basaltic watersheds and warm wet tropics. We know this from Mizera et al. 2003. And here's a plot um, where you can see calculated CO2 consumption rate um, and the different localities. And yeah, uh, it's greatest in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, it's pretty expected. And then other cold places like Greenland, um, Canada, it, it's uh, very low. So key factors for evaluating uh, whether the Franklin Lip actually did contribute to global weatherability are what the existing climate, paleogeography, and topography was like. So uh, was it in place in tropics? Uh, what was its orientation to, uh, to precipitation like? Um, did it generate topography or did it get buried in rift basins? So these are the sorts of questions we would need to try and get at to understand whether the Franklin Lip did contribute to weatherability. So um, looking at that, the Nacuziac formation is a main extrusive outcropping of the Franklin Lip. It's, uh, it can get up to one kilometer thick today, um, but Jefferson et al. in 1985 noted prenite compelliate um, facies that they attribute to uh, basically an overlying stack of potentially two more kilometers of basalt that was eroded away. So based on this prenite compelliate barrel metamorphism, they hypothesized that the, these Nacuziac flows could have been up to three kilometers thick. Um, unfortunately, the next youngest units in this area, across, yeah, across this area, is uh, the lower Cambrian sandstone. So there is no direct record of exhumation that we can really examine here. Um, but based on both um, dynamic plume models um, and, and some sedimentary stratigraphic constraints, we do think that there's reason to believe that there was progressive uplift here. So from this is a figure from Friedrich et al. 
the idea is just that as your plume head um, impacts and impinges on the lithosphere, you will, and, and as it flattens and spreads out, you will see progressive uplift out to the margins of that plume head. So this is on a scale of hundreds of kilometers. Um, but they would expect this to continue for over 10 million years after uh, impingement. So definitely within the time frame that we're working with. And Rainbird, Rob Rainbird has noted that there is an unconformity um, in, on Victoria Island under the Nkusiak Formation where the sediments were uh, tilted and beveled um, with the arrival of the Nkusiak Formation. So the idea here is that that mantle plume caused uplift um, as, as it arrived. So we do have some, some evidence that this um, area was being uplifted and generating topography and getting eroded. Additionally, we do have that evidence from geochemistry. So I mentioned that Cox et al. 2016 study before. So they did, um, they have coupled strontium and neodymium isotopes from carbonates and mudstones from adjacent margins that see that juvenile flux of material. Um, but this is from the preceding 50 million years. So they didn't really have a direct link to the Franklin, um, but they do see this flux um, leading up to the stirt basically. They also did compile some um, chemical index of alteration values from the surrounding basins as well. You see moderately to strongly chemically weathered signals and fairly neoprotozoic neo samples. So both of these um, geochemical results are consistent with the idea that the Franklin lip was, was weathered. So we have the idea that there was topography generated, that it was weathered. Um, and here's just a schematic cross-section of what that could have looked like. Um, so we have the plume head impinging. We potentially had that two kilometers of overlying basalts that were eroded away. Um, and yeah, I just I do want to note that these reconstructions are, are just uh, positioned relative to modern topography. We're not really trying to indicate any absolute paleo elevations, just but just to give you an idea. So you you have this thickness of maybe two kilometers of basalt um, that's getting uh, uplifted and exhumed. Um, and this is across more than a thousand kilometers, right? So this is this is a huge amount of volume um, of material for weathering on a continental margin uh, as Siberia is newly drifted away. We actually also do have some thermal chronology results because we were really trying to get at this exhumation um, ideas to see if we could detect the exhumation history. So our sample F1966, we did try to get some thermal chronology from um, and so this is, these are two models that we tried to see. Um, we have these two proposals, right? If the Franklin lip was exhumed and weathered directly after emplacement, or if it was buried in rift basins and didn't contribute to weatherability. Um, and so we can test that, test whether those models fit our data. And walking through these models, we have model A on the left. There's this con constraint of emplacement at two to four kilometers depth. So that was just what we thought a typical emplacement depth would be. Would be. Um, both models have to reach the surface by 515 MA. That's that Cambrian unconformity. Um, but in model A, we basically just have these two constraints. Um, so there's no constraints in between emplacement and then that uh, the surface at 515 MA. Um, and so these black lines show uh, good fits. The white line is just one of these black lines highlighted just to show you an example. Um, it's easier to follow. Um, and so in this model, you can see, oh, the direct path is just exhumation. Um, in model B, however, we just allow the model to explore a broader range in emplacement depths, followed by um, burial. So it was allowed to get buried by, by sediments, is what we suppose, before being exhumed to the surface at uh, 515 MA. So um, both models do fit our data. Our, our data is. Um, doesn't provide a, a unique explanation for um, or unique support for either of these models. Um, but based on the other lines of evidence, like the, the unconformities noted, the evidence for erosion and weathering, we think model A is the more likely scenario of the Franklin lip being elevated and exposed. Okay, so to go over why the Franklin lip could have caused a global glaciation while the other other lips have not. Um, 
there are a number of things that, that work for the Franklin Lip in contributing to global weatherability. So it was in place at equatorial latitudes. We have that grand mean pole. Um, and from paleogeography reconstructions, we know that the Franklin Lip was on an open windward facing margin. So it's getting that precipitation um, and, um, and runoff from, from uh, the tropics. Uh, we know that Siberia is newly rifted away. Um, and we have this like scattered uh, positioning of the continents. So that means that there's more exposed continental margins or increasing the surface area for weathering uh, globally, basically. Um, and we have evidence that that margin experienced uplift and erosion rather than burial. In contrast, um, the Mackenzie lip is a another huge lift that comes to mind at 1.27 MA in the same area. So it would have also drifted into the tropics um, with the Franklin lift. But uh, you can see from this reconstruction from Evans and Mitchell 2011 that uh, the continents are much more clustered together. The Mackenzie is more um, intercontinental. Um, there are fewer open margins for weathering and the Mackenzie lift might have been in place in a subsiding basin. So there's evidence for like a central depression rather than uplift and erosion. Um, Siberian traps camp also obvious examples to compare the Franklin lip to, um, but they were both in place in warm background climate states. Um, Siberian traps also in place at high latitudes. So if you remember that plot from the Zara et al showing Greenland and Canada not really contributing to CO2 consumption. Um, so both of these conditions would have increased the barrier to reaching the threshold for runaway glaciation. And in summary, um, so our new geochronology shows that the Franklin lip was in place between 719.86 plus or minus 0.21 MA and 718.61 plus or minus 0.3 MA. This precedes the onset of the Syrian glaciation by approximately 0 0.9 to 1.6 million years. It's much more consistent with the weathering hypothesis timescales. And it's not consistent with sulfur aerosols forcings. Um, and it's hard to say that the frame lip is completely unrelated to the onset of glaciation. But also it's important to note that the background climate state is really essential to determining what the climate impact of the lip will be. Um, so I just wanted to end there and, and open up for questions. Thanks, Judy. Well done. Um, can you hear me? I think my microphone is Oh, yeah, isn't... I can hear you. OK, great. Um, OK, so we'll go on and move on to the question session. We have um, several that were asked in the chat, and I'll get to just walking through those in a second here. Um, but just to let everybody know, you can ask by typing a question in the chat, or you can raise your hand. And I'll, I'm going to be doing my best to get to everything in the order they're received. Um, just uh, go to remind people how to raise your hand at the bottom of the screen. You've got your uh, reactions button. If you click reactions, there's a little box that pops up at the very bottom is the raise hand button. So just to remind you all. Um, so let's start with a question that came in during one of your intro slides from Karthik Murari Karnam. Where does the biologically okay. induced glaciation theory gain evidence and support from. And he then also asks about the how the paleogeography of the Sturtian uh, at the time of the Sturtian could support these conditions. Oh, um, so that the question was. Oh. It was sent it's, directly to me. It's not in the chat, so. OK. Sorry. But the idea, um, was it just for, sorry, sorry, I just missed the beginning of the question, um, but it was about yeah. the biological induced. Um, yeah, induced I think it, what, where does, what is the um, weight behind it basically, or what, where, where does the biologically induced glaciation theory gain evidence and support? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so it, it was just noted that, um, that there, there might have been an expansion of eukaryotic algae in the Neoproterozoic. So that's that's more based on this idea, a rough idea of diversification in the Neoproterozoic. Um, sediments older than 750 MA don't, don't carry um, those eukaryotic uh, sterines. Um, but there are some different ideas there. So Zipperman et al. Uh, 
propose that um, anaerobic remineralization would have produced these bicarbonates that would have increased the alkalinity of the oceans, and then that would have interacted with the atmosphere to draw down CO2. So that's like a buffering reaction. Whereas Fulner at all was more interested in just like the um, other like uh, organic processes that algae do. So producing these organic sulfur aerosols. Um, and so the idea here is that maybe if these organic sulfur aerosols can make it into the atmosphere, um, they could also reflect incoming solar radiation. So these ideas are more based on um, these rough uh, ages on the expansion of eukaryotic algae, but um, there's, there's not really uh, good time constraints on these mechanisms. Alternatively, we could say that the Franklin was a flood of material for algae as well, um, and maybe produced this effect on, on the left. Um, and then the paleogeography, I think I <clears throat> covered in the later slides, it's just from the reconstructions, we can see that the Franklin book was in place at equatorial latitudes on open margin. All right. And uh, Richard, I saw your comment. Uh, well, just a few questions here, and then you'll be the first hand. Um, and then, so the other part of Karthik's question was, do you, could the paleogeography of the time support such conditions? So I guess maybe comment on the paleogeography and um, maybe related to this biology aspect. Oh, um, yeah, so I guess that if the Franklin lip could have produced nutrients um, for the algae to anaerobically uh, metabolize stuff, uh, then the fact that it was in place on that open margin washing stuff into the ocean would have been easy, right? All right, great. So the second question, some of this was uh, answered in the chat amongst uh, people, but I, I'm gonna read through these for the video. Um, Paul Hoffman asks, can the depth of sill emplacement be estimated from magma dynamics? Richard Ernst responded, there's one study in the high Arctic large igneous province trying to think of the author that used the size of saucer-shaped saucer sills as a constraint on depth, the larger sills being in place deeper. Do you have any comments on that, um, Judy? Yeah, uh, we actually do, um, do know that saucer-shaped sills are mostly a, a shallow crust phenomenon, so that um, saucer-shaped sills are mostly in place less than um, five kilometers depth. Um, so that is actually a pretty convenient constraint, except for the fact that the Franklin sills are not um, not necessarily saucer shaped. So we can't, we're not sure if that is a constraint we can use for the Franklin. Um, otherwise, the, the idea that the sills and dikes are, are relatively shallow comes from like compositions, like affiliated compositions. Um, that's usually a low pressure um, melt. So uh, others like White and McKenzie have noted that your seals and dikes should be less than like uh, 80 kilometers step. Um, okay, cool. Thanks. The, so Lyle Nelson asked next about the rhyolite dome. Is the rhyolite dome genetically related to the Franklin lip in any way? Uh, no, these are just rhyolites in the Yukon. Uh, I actually don't know what they're related to. But that all the details of those studies are in that McDonald et al. 2017 paper, Cryogeny of the Yukon. Virtually. Okay, cool. Thanks, Francis. <laughs> oh, what do you say? Oh, uh, let me. Oh, he, he just mentioned that the, those rhyolites are probably RIF related. Oh, okay, okay. All right. Okay, with that, I think we're up to date with those up to when Richard raised his hand. So Richard, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please go ahead. OK, thanks. Thanks, Judy. That was a, it's quite a comprehensive, amazing story by you and your, and your co-authors. It's uh, very cool. And I, I just wanted to add that um, just kind of a global perspective of where else we see Franklin Age magnetism. You mentioned the Siberian connection. And over time, we now have a number of Bedelliite ages from different dike swarms and intrusions in Southern Siberia. So that 
connection is becoming more robust, although they're not as precisely dated. And then in the uh, Kalahari Craton in Zimbabwe, um, there was a, it was a master's thesis and it was reported by Hansen et al. of 725 Mutari dikes and then a continuation into Antarctica. Um, Ashley Gumsley et al. work that's been an abstract and in, uh, in preparation for publication. And then most recently in South China, a paper by Liu et al. that just came out within the last few months uh, describing a, a, an equivalent of the equivalent age, 720-ish. Uh, um, fairly widespread in the South China Craton. And then we also have a hint in Baltica. There's a, in the Ural Mountains, we have less well precisely dated magnetism of the, of the same age. So as great as the contribution by, by the Franklin event on its own, um, there's, it's, it's potentially augmented in perhaps a very similar timing um, by similar Franklin age magnetism and all these other blocks. So that's just what I wanted to add. Right, yeah, that there, there's a lot of evidence for other volcanism at this time. And then if you consider that with the orientation of the continents that are like a little bit scattered with those open margins, yeah, that, that could have also been another reason to that these events all contribute to global weatherability at around the same time. Yeah, yeah, thanks. You're welcome. All right. Um, just to, uh, Paul, you're next, but just to remind everybody, I see people using the clap emoji. If you're trying to raise your hand, but you're using the clap emoji, raise hand is at the bottom of the reactions. It's not the clap emoji. Um, okay, Paul, please unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Yeah, am I unmuted? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the dimethyl sulfide idea of Foilner, it's actually an interesting idea. Um, it's believed to be quite significant in cloud nucleation and, uh, and probably plays a significant role in the fact that in the modern, uh, there's no difference between uh, oceanic and continental albedos. They're essentially the same. For example, the northern and southern hemisphere have exactly the same albedo, despite the fact there's twice as much continental area in the northern hemisphere that compared with the south. And so there's no paleontological evidence for this other than that there is said to be uh, a radiation of, eu of eukaryotes, including eukaryotic algae in the Tonian and perhaps in the late Tonian, although I don't, you know, this is, the data is very sparse. And so uh, these compounds are, are produced by eukaryotic algae. And so the effect would be to increase the planetary albedo and make the climate overall cooler. And no matter what the proximal trigger is, it's always helpful if, uh, uh, and in some cases like the aerosol argument is dependent on having a, a, a preconditioned cool climate. And after all, uh, snowballs are rare in earth history and we have two of them in a row, which suggests that uh, there's something about the general condition in addition to the proximal triggers, which could well be different for the two snowballs. Yeah, that there's something that maybe there's something already destabilizing the climate state that allows for this entry into the Maranoan directly after the stream. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, I guess there are a lot of factors that are contributing to cooling at this time. Although I, I would say this cloud condensation nuclei hypothesis would be like similar to the sulfur aerosols hypothesis in that it has to be a pretty immediate trigger. Otherwise, you reach um, if you remember um, this curve, uh, you go back to your original state pretty rapidly because uh, the aerosols ring out. And there's not a lot of evidence that with just by scaling this up that this time scale will change significantly. So between a, a super volcano and a lip, um, we maybe wouldn't change this time scale that much. Yeah, the, the stratospheric aerosol is, a, is quite a different process. They both have the effect of increasing albedo, but the DMS that operates at, uh, at, in the lower troposphere above the yeah. sea surface. Uh, this has nothing to do with the, uh, um, the stratospheric aerosol. And so the time dependencies are quite different, although I agree with you, depending on how shorter, yeah. the algae are and their evolution of uh, 
of whatever the process is that produces these uh, rather varied organic uh, aerosols uh, that then serve in complex ways under specific conditions as cloud nucleation sites. <laughs> so, but yeah. it, uh, I think it's a, uh, uh, you know, we shouldn't treat this idea as a joke. And Fulner is a serious scientist. Yeah, yeah, that this is probably already changing what your tropospheric conditions are are like. Um, maybe even, yeah, going back to the Neoproterozoic, yeah. All right, uh, so we have an order of hands here, just to go over it, it was Andre Becker, Greg R, and then Ian Dalziel. Um, Andre, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, uh, great talk, Judy. So I'm just wondering, and it's out of my field, but uh, I sort of thinking uh, if you have a um, emplacement, uh, so, so probably a volcanism would happen at first stage, and then after volcanism uh, in a magmatic chamber, you will have cooling and uh, sort of solidification of magma. And so in that sense, your ages might be uh, somewhat um, younger than the age of volcanism. I don't know by how much, but probably it could be thousands of years to millions of years, which would be a consistent with weathering hypothesis you have. But on the other hand, if you would have later, if you predispose system to uh, cold uh, conditions, and then if you would have felsic uh, volcanism, you could release a uh, sulfur dioxide and that could be a short term trigger to glaciation. So let's say if you have any thoughts about it. Yeah, so, I guess just the first thing you mentioned, if volcanism is first and then the, the intrusives are second, um, we actually know from these other studies, um, for example, from that camp study that the intrusives and extrusives, there's no clear order to them for lips. Um, so it's, it would be hard and wrong to say that extrusives only precede the intrusives. They, they do alternate in stages. And then conveniently for the Franklin, we have these geochemical links. So uh, type one and type two uh, classifications include both uh, extrusive and intrusive rocks. Um, so then our timing for type two would in include both the extrusive and inclusive just based on that geochemistry link. Um, and so that, that time span is still what we think is representing that majority of emplacement for the Franklin lip, which would still be consistent with weathering, right? It, it would still proceed by about a million years, um, those onset constraints. But, but how long does it take for large magmatic intrusion to cool down and to solidify? Yeah, so for these sills, um, on the order of 100 meters thickness, they're pretty much <clears throat> would be almost instantaneously. So like those sills and dikes would cool um, on order of probably like days to years, hundreds of years, potentially if you're having recharge events, um, but it's geologically instantaneous and wouldn't be reflected in our geochronology. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, Greg, if you'd like to go ahead, please unmute yourself. Yeah, that was wonderful, Judy. I'm completely convinced the dating is awesome. Uh, and I'm sure Richard Ernst is pretty pleased too. Uh, these, these LIPs are always a short, sharp shock, almost all of them. Um, large batch lavas that uh, wreak havoc on short timescales, but I do have my doubts whether it could have caused Snowball Earth, uh, which lasted for 57 million years afterward. And I'm reminded especially of the Ordovician glaciation, the Hernantian glaciation, which is preceded by a short sharp shock of the Alcaparosa LIP in Argentina. Um, that one, of course, uh, we think the Hernantian was caused by the evolution of land plants, creating an enhanced, actually an order of magnitude increase in the degree of weathering on land. I think the 
Snowball Earth was caused similarly by an increase in weathering on land. I have two papers on this showing that there's a big increase in calcid paleosols over gypsid paleosols, both in central Australia and uh, in Arizona preceding this. Um, this would, of course, um, get the whole system poised to overcome a short, sharp shock uh, and then go into a much deeper uh, change. I, I, I've got a whole bunch of data on this coming out in GSA today in December um, issue, but um, could you address that biological cause, which of course is related to the eukaryote expansion that P.B. Cohen and everyone likes too, because the increase in weathering of the soils on land would of course feed the, feed the sea and enable greater productivity there and carbon drawdown. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that is another, um, I guess it's a knock against the Franklin in terms of weathering rates because you don't have plants facilitating that yet. Um, uh, but if you think about um, weathering on Hawaii, for example, there's these like fresh basalts. Um, weathering can actually penetrate pretty deeply into the surface. Um, and so maybe that dynamic that even if you have um, this weathering paleosol buildup um, without plants interacting with that, you could still have precipitation penetrating pretty deep into that regolith because of this um, porous basaltic um, weathering product. Um, I guess this would maybe go back to that, what you're saying, um, if the Franklin lip was a source of nutrients to, um, to algae in the oceans that then you could have had greater remineralization and burial of organic material. That, that is kind of um, what has been proposed by others before without any um, geochronology. Um, so yeah, plants would have uh, helped even more, I think, but maybe wouldn't have been that important for something like the Franklin lip, just because it's this huge basaltic province in the tropics. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, Ian, uh, Ian Dalziel, your hand was up next. Please unmute yourself. Here, yeah, whoops. Is that okay? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. Maybe somebody like Paul could comment on it, but <clears throat> in, from my reading, in relation to the background to what preceded the Franklin event, uh, is it not significant that the Conorock in the Southern Appalachians and the Kaigas in Namibia are interpreted to be um, glacial deposits, glaciogenic deposits at 750 million years, apparently fair, reasonably well dated, um, suggesting that there was a background cooler environment when the Franklin came along? Uh, that, uh, this is actually pretty interesting because that is the subject of my next chapter. Um, <laughs> but yeah. uh, we are um, working on clarifying the nature of the Conorock and Kaihas glaciation. So working on the deposits that have been described and attributed to the Kaihas glaciation and on the Kalahari Craton. There's actually been a recent paper by Mandy Ziegler Hoffman et al. Um, who's done a lot of the Tridal Zircon work on Kalahari. Um, and so they have re-correlated uh, re most of the Kaihas deposits that have been identified to the Sturdian. So the Kaihas uh, glacial deposits could just be a problem of miscorrelation across, um, across the Harib, just because it's very complicated um, truncated stratigraphy uh, because it's so tectonically deformed. Um, so Kaihas and Kalahari could be just the Sturdian, um, but that 750H will be, um, it, it is from stratigraphy below the Sturt. Um, it's from these rhyolites um, that correlate with Conorac, as you noted. So that could instead be a link to rifting um, at that time at 750MA. Um, and Conorac could, could be a rift related deposit as well. So it's unclear if there is actually glaciation at 750 MA. And we actually know from, uh, I think Rooney et al has a study of Laurentian deposits at spanning 750 MA that are not glacial. 
So that precludes a, a global glaciation at 750 MA. So if the Conorak or Kaihas was uh, a real glaciation, it, it was limited in scale. Um, but we think it's more likely related to that those diamagtites are probably rift related. Okay, thank you. I, I certainly got the impression they were not global in scale, I wasn't implying that, but just that they might be suggesting coolness. But yeah. thank you very much for an interesting talk, Judy. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to jump back to the chat real quick. Um, Phoebe Cohen mentioned something that was relevant to the biological um, part of this, uh, or the biological hypothesis. If anything, the most compelling evidence for radiation of photosynthetic eukaryotes is close to uh, one, 1 billion. So um, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, but it's, it is more oh. just a comment, relevant comment. Yeah, I, I mean, so that's just another, um, I mean, that's that would be hard then to justify a biologic trigger for the, the sturgeon if these changes happened even further back in, in time. Right, okay, cool. Then, so I have hands up from Richard and Jing Jun. Richard, I'm gonna jump over to Jing Jun first so, to hear from everybody. So Jing Jun, please uh, lower your hand or, or uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Julie, that's a wonderful talk. Uh, I was uh, wondering in your previous slide, you were showing a, a, a factor of 10 or so uh, differences in the CO2 L gassing, very from one teramol per year to less than 0.1 teramol. And, uh, and you, you correctly said that's uh, based on different climate state. So is there any uh, geochemical evidence on the Franklin? Such as strontium or something, on the uh, weathering intensity of the of the Frank, uh, you know, at, using today's uh, lips as a knowledge. Oh, um, yeah. I, I guess the only thing I can think of would be the the chemical index of alteration samples from Cox et al. Um, that 2016 paper compiles them. Um, I don't have that figure uh, pulled up, but um, just the idea that it was um, moderate to strongly chemically altered. Um, so the background CO2 is state is higher, so any lever is going to be weaker. But sorry, I missed the beginning of that. The CO2 background state is going to be significantly higher, and so any lever will be weaker. Yeah. Um, because yeah, of the climate dub CO2 doubling relationship. Yeah. Um, sorry, Jin Jin, did that answer your question, or did you have something else? Uh, yeah, that, yeah, thanks, really. That's really pretty much most of the question, but I want to comment on what Paul just said. We, our aspen, CO2 aspen in the mid is pretty is pretty bad. Like it jumping mm -hmm. from anywhere from two times higher or 50 times higher. You can find evidence for any of the claims. So we are really, <laughs> we are really have a hard time having a, determining the background state in CO2. But we know what the yeah. solar luminosity was. Yeah, but we don't know yeah. the methane concentration and well, water is like uh, NCO. Yeah, okay, it would cool. be a very simplified oh. estimate just based on stellar luminosity. If, but the other gases would also be probably minor, I guess. I know there's a whole literature discussing what that what the global greenhouse gases could have been like at this time. Yeah. Yeah, and I do remember Paul's 2017 one delves into it a good one, a good bit. Um, okay, Richard, uh, you know, I want to get an feedback with methane, so it doesn't control it, it doesn't adjust to the climate, it affects the climate. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, ahead, I just yeah. okay, a question and a, a comment and a question. Um, Judy, you were, you know, emphasizing that the new geochronology and the summary by Caswell et al. is great, um, and uh, and and demonstrating that so many of these lip events are incredibly short duration. I just wanted to say that from the broader perspective, there are also some lip events that are known that are 
more protracted in length and represent multiple pulses. Each, now the question is whether the multi, each of the multiple pulses could be short duration and or not. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of the Keweenawan event of the Mid-Continent Rift region, which starts around 11, 10 or so, and then goes to about 1085, but has two main pulses around 1107 and 1099 or so. And so, um, and, and it's an important thing as we go forward to try and you know, identify those based on the preliminary data that are actually really short duration and should potentially have a more significant impact on, um, on climate and those that are multi-pulsed events where the pulses may be short, may be long, and we'll see about their effect. In, in, it was Ian Campbell, I uh, forget exactly the publication, that mentioned that in some of these multi-pulse events, uh, that the second pulse could be, the first pulse could be the arrival of the mantle plume. The second pulse could be the onset of decompression melting uh, above a hot plume and that sort of thing. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out and, uh, and yeah. say that's kind of a going open area that we, we're crying out now for the sort of second generation dating of super precision. We have so many events now that we've dated preliminary way, a lot of those are Bedelliite ages, but they're, by being Bedelliite ages, they're confirmed to be igneous. So we know we got these events, but the second generation dating, such as what you're doing of super high precision chemical liberation of zircons is going to be exciting to take us to the next step and fully identify, you know, those short duration events and their precise ages for matching with the, the uh, geological record and the climatic record. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Richard. I, I, I do want to know, based on the things that you've you've mentioned, so um, I, I think you, you are emphasizing how important it is to get geochemistry on these uh, pulses as well, just to see, to try to better understand what the relationship of all these pulses are. Um, like we, we know for the Franklin that there's these links and proposed in South China, but when you look at the geochemistry, um, people say like, oh, these are probably not related, that this is a separate arc event or a separate rift event, right? And so once it starts to get to these protracted pulses, um, I think it's really important to try and understand the geochemistry of these pulses, how, if they are related all to the same mantle plume or if there are just um, other events happening at the same time, right? Yeah, well, this, this re understanding the reconstructions at say this time 720 is, is key and we still got a lot of mysteries. You know, the, the Baltica stuff could actually still be in the range of the, of the Franklin lip. That's, you know, and the other, that would be adjacent to Greenland at the time and the Franklin lip fully extends into Greenland. So whether it potentially extends into Eastern margin of Baltica, that's possible. But where the South China event is, um, where the, uh, the Kalahari event is, um, that I think that's open question whether it's the same plume or, or a different plume. And just one thing about the chemistry, um, you know, we've been working with Julian Pierce on, you know, on, on quote, lip printing and looking at the geochemistry of, of, of lips and the idea that many, many, many lips, including many of the classic young ones, have an arc type signature, right? And so um, that kind of negative niobium tantal anomaly is not necessarily giving us, you know, in such events is not saying that it's arc related. It could also be that it's uh, the magma is interacting with a lithosphere that was previously metasomatized during earlier during an earlier subduction event. So, uh, but the geochemistry is still critical to try and figuring out the architecture and tracking of different magma batches from different source areas in the same lip near the plume center, far from the plume center, generated from the lithosphere in different lithospheres and different trait terrains that are making it up. So it's the geochemistry is going to be key, but if the geochemistry is it's not the same. The <laughs> yeah. Right? But this high titanium, low titanium is a really good division. So um, yeah. Can I ask one other thing though? I just, that was, uh, I, uh, is that okay? Or uh, Alex, can I do just this hey, one? Go ahead. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So on your pre, you, know, you had the diagram there showing the, um, the climate change, uh, the previous diagram you had up for a while there, showing the oh, uh, yeah. flux in CO2. And I was just yeah. thinking, of course, we have the two things going on in all of these lips. We have the, the release of gas from 
the volcanic and it's also from the, the release of CO2 from the volcanic portion and then also from the intrusive portion that's interacting with sediments, the so-called thermogenic gas release. So there's a huge pulse of CO2 in the beginning. Um, and as this curves show, you know, you can, for the Siberian trap to can and camp, you can capture it all or much of that back through the weathering. But the critical thing is to get, end up getting substantially lower um, by the end, by the end of the weathering than at the beginning, you're marginally lower or the same with the decan, a little bit lower with the camp. And I think the camp is associated with some recognized cooling. Um, if we tried to do this for the Franklin event, um, could, I'm not sure how, I, I'm not, I know the details of this modeling, but you need to get substantially below the original um, CO2 level, right? To, to have it be cooling because you started presumably uh, had a pulse of CO2 into the atmosphere. And now you're going to use weathering to pull it out again. You know, yeah. you either put less into the atmosphere from the Franklin event, or you pull, pull more of it out um, through weathering to get you into the, the snowball stage. And what is the critical drop in CO2 that we need for snowball? I guess it depends on all the things everybody's been talking about, about the yeah, condition. Yeah, we have no constraints on what PCO2 would have been like. Um, we could estimate just from stellar luminosity, but of course that's hugely uncertain. Um, so yeah, we, we haven't tried to do this, haven't made this curve ourselves just because it's so uncertain. Um, but yeah, you're, you're totally right. It would have been a large initial, initial pulse and then you would have had to even drive this even lower than the camp here, right? But yeah. Thanks, that's that's really, great work. Yeah. Cool. All right, uh, Paul, you got another question. I think having a tail on the on the volcanism is very important for the weathering hypothesis because it provides fresh rock to the weathering zone. If you shut off the magmatism completely, within 50, 100,000 years, you have a mature weathering profile. And then you're having to wait for tectonics to lift fresh rock into the weathering zone. So volcanism providing fresh rock at the surface is a great way of pulling down CO2 rapidly. And the key is rapidly. You've got to beat the silicate weathering feedback. Yeah. Um, but I guess we would just assume that those pulses, if they're younger pulses, would be small enough that we haven't seen them for these. I guess we wouldn't have captured it for the Franklin study, at, at least. OK, so well, how long does it take for that? profile, that silic, that stable uh, road, uh, weathering profile to kick in? Well, <clears throat> I don't know. I would say a rough estimate is 50,000 years. And I should have added that in addition to tectonics, you have incision. That, that also effectively brings fresh rock into the weathering zone by expanding the weathering zone. But if you think about it spatially, uh, it's uh, and that, that's where details like elevation and things like that become important and winds and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's, it's 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 nothing, on the geological time scale, the development of a, of, a, of, a, of a mature weathering profile, and Greg knows, you know, can correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, from, from an unweathered rock surface is geologically fast. It's, it's, it's tens of thousands of years. Yeah. You got the but, thumbs up from um, Greg. Can I jump in here since uh, Paul introduced me at least? Yeah, Paul is right. Um, every time you get one of these big lips and the oxisols and the ultrasols go north and south and it, it draws down yeah. quickly. But that's not what we're talking about with the beginning of snowball earth or the beginning of the Paleozoic glaciations. Those are step functions it became much cooler for a long period of time. It wasn't a blip. Well, it wasn't cool in the aftermaths. <laughs> yes. You can see that in the biomarkers. There's nobody there at home in the tropics except bacteria. Um, oh, I, I, I doubt that actually, but... <clears throat> But the albedo phase of the, <laughs> the eukaryotes are huddling at the poles waiting for things to cool down. Is, isn't albedo the key thing though? And once you get into albedo conditions, that's self reinforcing until volcanism builds up over time to, to 
you know, to uh, end that that climate, or you have a major lip event that contributes to the end of it. So the the albedo is a key thing. Once you get into those conditions, you're stuck there for a while, right? Yeah, no, it's an albedo driven phenomenon. So that's that's the step. That's pretty much a step thing. Once you cool things enough to get yourself into it, um, it's not going to be so easy to get out of it. Exactly right. David Evans put something in the chat that's relevant. Um, weathering along rifted margins can, can you hear me? Okay. Weathering along rifted margins can persist for a long time via recession of the escarpment, as it is still happening at Deccan today. Yeah, so this is relevant to, um, as Paul was saying, that you would have to wait for topographic response um, after you create that weathering profile. Um, so it would be on a longer time scale, but still relevant to our million year time scale of um, cooling. So you, you talked about these uh, um, prenate from metamorphosed parts of the, um, success, the vol volcano clastic succession. Um, and to me, I was just wondering what if if you if there is and it, maybe there is already, is there a metamorphic age on that? Is it really close to the same time? Um, I don't think there is a metamorphic age on that. Um, so we, I guess going back to <laughs> the thermocron. Um, mm. So you're talking about this point that um, they notice in these basalts that you have these prenate and palliate facies, um, but we have nothing on top of it besides lower Cambrian units. So there's, it's not obvious if it's two kilometers of basalts on top or two kilometers of sediments on top that would have provided um, this metamorphic facies event. Um, mm -hmm. And then if we look at the thermocon sample, we we do have from the Great Slave Lake, um, the zircon ages are only partially reset. You can see it due to radiation damage mostly. Um, yeah. But appetite is almost, is um, is partially reset as well. So appetite um, basically only provides constraint um, out, out here in the Phanerozoic. So we don't really have any appetite data um, concerning this neoprotozoic neo end of the, the thermocron model. Um, so I, I guess I would be concerned that things would have been reset. Um, okay. If, yeah, so I don't know if you would be able to get a prenite from Pellier, um age. Okay, because, well, so my, I guess my interpretation of that slide was that it could have been due to two full kilometers of, of that much volume of the same rock that was weathered away and contributed to CO2 drawdown, is that right? Yeah, that it could be. Yeah. Um, that was all. That was what Jefferson and all thought. So they they thought like, oh, this must have been way figure of a basalt sequence. Um, but since they have no geochronological constraints, you know, it, it could be a basalt package or it could be a sediment package on top. If yeah. if the Franklin and uh, was like, yeah. If he, if you could get a date on that, then I guess it would be kind of cool to prove that it all happened right then. But uh, I think it, it would be also interesting to see what the based on the present day extent of the this, you know, of the Franklin lip, you could probably do a quick sort of calculation to show, you know, how much CO2 this much removal of two kilometers of overburden would have would have done. And that's sort of a minimum amount of CO2 removal, I think, for that event, right? Is it has it been done? Maybe they did it in that paper? Um. I, I don't think so, actually, because our, our, um, oops, uh, our estimate of the area of the Franklin is kind of recently expanded, um, because previously it wasn't until, uh, Vouter, um, Vouter Bleeker at all, um, they did this still at the Great Slave Lake that, um, we expanded the, the extent of the Franklin down south. So previously, um, I think in um, Richard's compilation, um, I think it was thought that the Franklin lip was 2 million square kilometers. Um, but now mm -hmm. we're just, um, we're 
making that even bigger. And then, of course, with these other uh, linkages that Richard's mentioned, that it could even be bigger than that. So no one's done that estimate yet for the, the new area okay. estimate that we have. But we, we could try that, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's not as simple and straightforward as I'm thinking it is, but I do feel like it would be a cool number to produce is just how much sort of see, drawdown yeah. power that had. Um, cool. Well, thanks, Judy. Uh, any, if anybody has any, any last thoughts, um, feel free to step up. I'll give you a few seconds. Go ahead, Daryl. Uh, just if we're putting four kilometers of basalt on top of a, essentially a stable craton or a craton margin, it's going to sink. You're not going to get a lot of relief uh, immediately. And, and it would take quite some time to, for that to float up again. So I think they have a problem of weathering uh, that material. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's effectively thickening the crust, so it's it's going to sink, but its its head is still going to be well above the mean the mean continental area. Yeah, you maybe get a kilometer out of it, but tough to get. Money. Yeah, I guess. Well, subsidence rate is also a factor, right? I guess it depends on how quickly you weather versus the subsidence rate. Well, the substance rate is is quite quick geologically. You know, in, in to, mm -hmm. like you look at the effect of, of ice sheets, the half life of substances is, is like twelve thousand years or something like that. So the weather yeah. rate will be controlled by the proximity to the ocean, basically. But in any case, okay. it's fast. I, I think this argument could easily be by looking in the field for paleosols between the flows. Every other LIP has paleosols between the flows. None have been described from Franklin, to my knowledge. Um, and it, in some cases, we have an oxisol in Oregon here, which was capable of undoing the whole middle Miocene blip in CO2. So paleosols between the flows would be a way to address this. Maybe they're not there. Maybe it's all pillow basalt. I've not we seen it. And, we should go and look for them. Yeah. Rob, Rob, <laughs> may, have actually, Rob may have actually we'll seen be, some We're very surprised if you don't find them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, my days of polar exploration might be behind me, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's, yeah but no, it's a good idea. Speak to that. You know, look, after all, they're, they're, you know, they're paleosols on all the interglacials. So, you know, it doesn't take long. Yeah, That's there is. Yeah. Or is it all um, just a big intrusion? Um, well, I, I did want to note that <laughs> So you're, you're right that the loading of two kilometers of basalt would definitely uh, cause some subsidence. Um, but we, we would also be competing with the buoyancy provided by this plume head arrival and uh, flattening. Um, and of course, these are, these are on different timescales. But at the very least, we do see evidence in the geologic record for um, uplift and erosion rather than immediate subsidence. Okay, great. Um, thanks for a great talk and also some really great discussion at the end here, Judy. Really uh, longest one of the season so far. The last two people had to go early. So hopefully we didn't keep you from anything you need to get to. But uh, Oh no, I definitely cleared my morning for this. <laughs> well done, Judy. Right, Judy. Yeah, well done. All right, thanks everybody. Um, we'll see you next week uh, and take care.